Come on by and have a bite at the Crossroad Diner, the place your spirit goes when it's time to think about a new direction. I'm Bob Darling, and today I'm in the diner with your host, Steve McCurdy. Welcome back to the Crossroad Diner. Uh, you have been listening to the introduction by my good friend, uh, Bob Darling, uh, who's a wonderful voiceover talent and a good friend of mine for the last, how long have we been doing this, Bob? Three years? Five? Yeah, I think it's probably closer to five. I think it's closer to five years. Uh, we were in a uh, coaching uh, session together with another uh, great voiceover talent, Domingo uh, Castillo, and um, and we got to be very good friends. And so when I started doing the podcast, he was one of the first people I wanted to call. So, Bob, welcome to the Crossroad Diner. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Yeah. Good. Um, we're going to talk, you know, in the diner here, we talk about um, – about choice points, places in our life where we, you know, we, we were going in one direction and for whatever reason we changed direction. So tell us a little bit about when you were growing up, what did you think you wanted to do? Uh, what did your family tell you you were going to do? How did that, how was that, how did that take shape for you? <laughs> well, um, I always liked technology and, uh, electronics. So I was always fiddling around with, with some kind of circuit doing something. And so um, my parents decided that um, I should go, I should become an engineer. Okay. And, and I should go to college and, and uh, you know, choose some engineering uh, uh, curricula and, um, and just make that my career as an engineer. Okay. So, and yeah. So what uh, happened so, then? So, so I did, I, I, uh, uh, Went to, I was accepted in a uh, Eastern, Northeastern engineering college up in Northern New York on the Canadian border and uh, started out as an electrical engineer, two years. Uh, the Vietnam War came along at the same time uh, or was peaking around the same time that I was deciding that uh, I'd about had it with uh, with snow and ice and uh, uh, 30 below zero and um uh, and I really was thinking that maybe electrical engineering wasn't really what I wanted to do. <laughs> okay. And and so I quit. And um, and of course, you know, the um, our country was ready to take me in uh, their warm arms. And uh, so anyway, I I was uh, I signed up, went in the Air Force for four years. And during that time, I decided that uh, I, I was an enlisted guy. Uh, and I it was it was good work. Uh, and it was electronics based, um, and uh, and I liked it, but uh, but I realized that uh, that wasn't for me either, uh, and I really didn't want what I thought of as a blue collar job, right. which is what I thought of as uh, you know I thought the the Air Force assignment was was kind of that. So I sat under a palm tree, and uh, in Fiji of all places. Uh, and believe it or not, that was that was the, the, the last Air Force assignment I had. And you that's about all I can tell you about it. But anyway, um, uh, and I wrote back to the college and I said, would you take me back? Uh, but I want to I want to get into this other program uh, that combines engineering and marketing and management. And uh, and they said, uh, yeah, OK, you're in. And so I went back, graduated uh, and went to work for. Uh, General Electric, who had created this program at that school as what in those days they called a sales engineer. And uh, and the reason they created that was they said, well, our engineers are really smart, but they can't talk to anybody. And our salespeople can talk to anybody, but they don't know what they're talking about half the time. So uh, they created this, you know, kind of uh, combined degree. So it was a guaranteed job. Went to work for them in their marketing uh, group uh for two and a half years and then i was attracted away by a management consulting firm so let I me interrupt that. you for a second let me yeah. interrupt you for a second so when you Go went ahead. back into school uh you you kind of glossed over that like you know i went to school I graduated did this tell me about the classes the process the sense of whether or not you were in the right place um yeah. that that sort of thing well um i liked it a lot more. And, and certainly some of it had to do with, as my, as my mother put it, uh, a maturation uh, step. Right. But, um, but I, uh, I really enjoyed the, the, um, uh, 
different kinds of of studies that we were that uh, that I was being exposed to, uh, business law, um, uh, psychology, including developmental psychology, um, uh, you know, every uh, accounting, um, along with engineering subjects, math, and and some additional. Uh, science uh so it, it was i like the mix you know it was, you were it was, engaged it, it engaged your mind yeah it was it was so varied that uh uh it was challenging and and it was fun yeah uh yeah so so yeah i felt like okay this is this is going in the right direction and then uh, you did that for a couple of years but what was it that attracted you away since that seemed like a fairly decent fit um, when you attracted me away to, uh, from GE you, or right. You, yeah. Yeah. You were, you were about to take us into the next step and I backed us up into college there, but okay. You know, yeah. Let's so forward to what, well, what caused that to change? Uh, I mean, this could be a really long story here. So just cut me off if, <laughs> if it goes too long, but, uh, so, uh, in, so I went to work for GE and they moved me from their headquarters in New York to, um, Tucson, Arizona, and I met my future wife there. And together, I well, I'm, after I was been after I had been there for two and a half years, they said, "Well, we have another assignment in uh, Salt Lake City, and we'd like you to take that assignment." Um, and uh, when I said, oh, "Okay," um, so I I flew up here and and looked a, looked the place over and thought, "Yeah, this is this is a great place." Okay. So I came to work here in Salt Lake City, uh, had a uh, good success in, in their uh, sales uh, position. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, I had a hobby of, of keeping saltwater fish. And my wife decided that, well, we, together we did over dinner one night, that maybe because the people in Salt Lake, the businesses didn't seem to really know how to raise saltwater fish. So we started our own business and she took it over. And, um, so we, and we built custom aquaria and so on. Anyway, so we were invited to this guy's home, he and his wife, uh, very well off. And, and, uh, they said, can you help us with this? We've got this problem with, with our saltwater aquarium. So I went over and we spent the evening there and, and, uh, afterwards, uh, he called me back and he said, I want you to come over and talk to me. And so I did. And he says, tell me all about your education, yada, yada, yada. And he said, uh, uh, I'd like you to take uh, some exams, but uh, I think we want to hire you uh, as as a consultant. Hmm. So I went through that process and then and he hired me uh, or they hired me. And I went to work for them for uh, about four years. And we. So what, this- what was the attraction? You were, you were kind of happy with where you were. What? Well, what it was. You? It was it was really twofold. It, it looked very exciting. Uh, I like the idea of um, uh, working with companies to help them solve bigger problems than just selling them something. Okay. And uh, and uh, travel was involved, which of course looked sexy and and exciting, you know, at the time, <laughs> for for a short time. Uh, and and then uh, uh, and it and it paid a lot more. And mm. so that was clearly an incentive. So, yeah, so I took it. We did that. Did some really funky and 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 uh, fun assignments. One of them was in uh, Caracas, uh, Venezuela, uh, mm. helping a company move from an old wooden rundown warehouse to a brand new distribution center up in the mountains above Caracas, which wow. was a real challenge since I don't speak Spanish. Uh, but anyway, it was that was fun. And uh, but we did a lot of projects. It was a blast. But um, like a lot of people who who get into a a job where travel is a big part of it, I was growing weary of the travel. And my wife and I were talking about uh, having a family, raising children. And and that was too much travel. I I would go away for a couple of weeks and come back on the weekend and then uh, maybe be there for a week and then go off again. And and so it was was too much travel. So. the next step was um, I knew a fellow here in Salt Lake who worked for a phone company, and uh, he said, yeah, we need some help with this and this. And all right, could you be interested in coming to work for us? And so I, I did for, um, for about a year and a half, and it was fun as, as operations manager. Um, and then 
another company here in Salt Lake that I'd done their <laughs> distribution center for. I'd been, done the design work and so on. They reached out to me and said, uh, we want you to come to work for us as an operations manager. And, uh, and it was more money. And uh, it was a music business. They oh. distributed uh, um, in those days LPs and cassettes. And, you know, I'm, I'm dating myself severely here. But um, and they were getting into the book distribution business, which also looked interesting. And so I said, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll do that. So I did that. Uh, they were bought out by another company who um, both the general manager and I uh, didn't and we'd become friends. We didn't really think too much of how they like to do business. So we said, no, nah, I don't think we're going to stay on with you. So I went back to consulting. and. Uh, but only okay. briefly now, and locally, so no right. more travel. Yeah. So let me just interrupt the flow for a minute here, because you're <laughs> making these decisions. They're being prompted in some cases by you wanting to change things, and in some cases by circumstances changing and making what you the deal you'd agreed to no longer attractive. So h- how did you make those decisions? What what's what's the important thing that you're looking for? Uh, in an opportunity? Well, I, I think there's a couple of things. Um, my longtime, lifetime best friend, who was my college roommate in the first two years, uh, we were we were real goof offs in those those two years. We had a lot of fun, but um, we would kid about, OK, what do you want to be when you grow up? Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, and we we both agreed that that either um, rock star or starship captain would be our choice. <laughs> And uh, but uh, what it came down to and we would joke about that, he would say, well, I think I think we ought to be real estate investment counselors. And and that was a big joke. And and I because we didn't know anything about that. Uh, But he said to me, says, well, why do you want a career? And I said, well, I don't know. Doesn't everybody do that? And he said, well, no. Uh, He said, "I, I think wouldn't it be fun if you just kept doing different things? Um, don't do one thing your whole life. And I said, you know, that, that sounds really good. Um, Mm -hmm. I, and I'm going to keep that in mind, you know, as, as, as I go through life. Interestingly, he really didn't do that. He, he did kind of what you deliver, you suggested early on, and that is start out with one thing and then shift to another, but then that's it. Right. I, um, my wife says that I've always been fearless um, and because I, I don't I just look at things as as just fun. Uh, I the next adventure. Right. right. And and uh, uh, so I've not had a lot of fear in business or or, uh, you know, in terms of any. So I've never thought of anything I've done as a career. Uh, okay. uh, that that's kind of a, my dad worked for AT&T for 35 years and uh and retired and i and i thought i I don't want to do that uh it was an unhappy thing for him he didn't mind the job but uh he was a really bright guy had several degrees and and it it just didn't uh it looked like the wrong thing to to lead a a happy life so so yeah i didn't want to do that so uh Shall I pick up on the on the thread or? or... Well, yeah, you can. I think we I think we've gotten some gist there. Enough. What, what, yeah. What I want to do is now um, have have you had people in your life, kids, other young people that you've had to be consigliere to and kind of watch them come up and make these kind of choices. What sure. what's the kind of advice that you give when a person is trying to pick a direction? We we've raised two daughters, um, okay, and and they're both married now, and uh, we have uh, a granddaughter and one on the way, uh, and one of the girls is a very creative, uh, has has you know real art talent. She paints amazingly well, um, and uh, so and our other daughter. Um, I think is is a very business minded entrepreneurial kind of personality. So the advice that I've tried to give them, although I have always said that advice is worth every penny you pay for it, free advice. Um, uh, but I've, the the advice I've tried to give them is um, 
don't let fear rule your decisions first right. and foremost, right? Because that's what destroys most dreams, I think. Uh, so try to be fearless. Um, and secondly, if something resonates with you, uh, go there. Uh, don't question it. Just do it. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it probably won't work out in the beginning, and you'll stumble a lot, and you may you know you may it may cost you some things, money, and maybe friends along the way. But uh, that's, that's okay. Um, if you can do it with a partner, uh, as in a lifetime partner, a wife, or 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 whatever, that's way better uh, because that that support system is is I think key to right. any success. Excellent. So those, point. That's, those are my suggestions to our two girls. That's super. Well, uh, since we, you know, we've got some restrictions on time here, and I want to get yeah. elements of the story that I that I find interesting. Um, that you went from all of that to a voiceover guy. Yeah, now that's yeah. a that's a leap. That's a that's a strange. <laughs> what what were the last What was the last thing yeah. you were doing before okay. you did yeah, that? Sure. So, so at one point, and we, uh, I had, I had started a, a, a small, uh, a two man to begin with, a computer network sales service consulting business. Uh, and it grew and grew and grew. And I had that for 20 years. And, uh, and it was, and it, 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 it was real fun because it, it, it combined technology and people. And, okay. and I really liked that. And, uh, so I, um, so I did that for about 20 years and then sold the business or merged it with another company, stayed on for a year, uh, and then left. But my wife, who also worked for the company, uh, stayed on longer. And the new company had a, a, a company meeting in Las Vegas. And, and for the first time ever, I was the spouse. <laughs> uh, I was not the president. I was not, I was not anybody important. Nobody talked to me. <laughs> Uh, or few people did. Anyway, so I was w one morning I was I didn't have anything to do. So I was down in the coffee shop and there was music on and and uh, over their PA system. And and uh, then a, a, a guy came on and he was talking about whatever's going on in the hotel and so on. And I thought, you know, I, I just it just came to me. I, thought, I bet I could do that. And I thought back to when I was in college, the first two years, um, this friend of mine and I, we were DJs on a college radio station. Right. And so and people have told me that uh, uh, and I, that, you know, I take this totally with a grain of salt that, that, that I have a good voice. Sure. And, and uh, I thought, well, yeah, there's got to be more to it than that. But uh, anyway, I dove in uh, and I did what I often do with business. And that as I, um, you know, I had some money set aside. So I said, OK, well, let's not just let, let's not just play around with this. Let's. Let's start out with very little expense, but pretty quickly, if it looks like this is doable, let's just invest. Let's just buy good equipment. Let's let's get good coaching, a good de a demo uh, via Bill DeWeese, by the way, uh, yeah. whose, whose demo I still use uh, after five years and still get business from. Got some newer ones. But anyway, let me, so let me tell the audience what you're talking about there. Uh, we we also share a coach. In Bill DeWeese. Bill DeWeese is a voiceover guy who you've probably heard everywhere and have no idea who he is. That's one of the interesting things about voiceover work is that uh, is that you can you can hear that person and never see them or hear their name. But he would teach this business, this voiceover business. And we took his course. And one of the other things that he offers is to help you craft your your demo audio. Uh, and so that when people are going to hire you. They listen to it, and it's got several different samples of the kinds of things that you could do. And they go, yeah, I think this guy could do it, so they hire you. Uh, and invariably in this business, who, which is normally kind of actors and folks who come up through that way, not through business like Bob, they change that demo every five minutes because they, they, just, they, want, they want that freshness. They want the difference. Bob and I squeeze a nickel till, it's, till it looks <laughs> like a, a penny. and um, and, and so you're still using that same demo tape and still earning money and getting gigs from it. Yes. Yeah. I have newer ones. Uh, and it depends on the, on the, uh, you know, uh, the media or the, the method that I'm putting this out there. But, uh, yeah, you'll still see it on my website, uh, or you'll still hear it. I should say that was back before anybody was doing video 
uh, right. type of demos uh, still there. And yeah, I still I still use and I, and I still get every week. I, I still get business off of one or more of, of, of those uh, samples in that uh, in that demo. So. Yeah. So you decided to go into it. You decided to invest in and kind of learn the business instead of by trial and error, have somebody kind of walk you through the ropes yeah. and, and learn yeah. what the actual truth is. Right. Uh, tell me how that's been going. Cause I, like you say, you and I have been talking to each other for at least five years about this yeah. Yeah. and working on it. Uh, how much before that did you get started? Uh, not too long. I, it maybe a year. Uh, okay. So, well, uh, I guess it would be about seven years total now. So maybe two years before that. Yeah. Right. So I love it. Um, yeah. You know, I don't, you know, you say, well, did you, did you go from something that maybe you shouldn't have done or you didn't love as much to something you really love? I really loved all the steps along the way. Um, but I would have to say that um, I, I really, really enjoy doing this. Uh, right. This is, this is a, whenever I get into the, you know, the, what I call the bat cave here. Um, whenever I'm in here, uh, reading new scripts, uh, getting into new stories, uh, it, it's just, uh, um, I, it just lights me up. You know, I, I just love it. So uh, I, I yeah. have found also that, that working with voiceover clients is a, is a lot more personal and a lot more fun because they've Definitely. got a lot of emotional, creative investment in what you're doing Absolutely. and in the outcome. And so it becomes very, very collaborative in a very positive way. I agree. Um, they are the, the the people that I have met in this industry have to be the nicest people I've ever worked with. And and so uh, and I, you know, I include other voiceover uh, people like yourself, but the clients uh, with very rare exception, they are just interesting and and really nice, sweet people. I mean, they're they're just wonderful to work with so yeah well, by nature of the, more. But by nature of the job they're storyteller people and yes. storyteller people are going to be engaged in life things not just you know how many cheetos can you sell so right. uh, t talk to them about your bat cave there explain what what you built and, and how that works um so uh i have a really good friend uh whose son is an audio engineer and this friend of mine can build anything and so I said, well, uh, let me do some research into what a booth should be, because, yes, it's about the microphone, but it's more about the space and how quiet is it and, and you know, echo free and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, so uh, I and he and his son came up with the design of this, this call it a room or a whatever. Uh, it's about <laughs> five feet by seven feet. And uh, it's I, you can't really tell from what you can see, but there are. There are panels that we built all around on the walls, and then there are things that absorb different kinds of frequencies. And um, so it's it's a pretty quiet place, which it needs to be. Uh, and then, you know, I've got studio monitors in here, and and uh, uh, I use a, um, what's, a Mac Mini for a computer, and it is silent. I guarantee that you can't hear anything. I can't hear, of course, my hearing isn't what it used to be, but... Um, and then fairly recently, I, I also put in the mix a um, what's uh, what's called a, a channel strip. And that feeds into a preamp and then into the computer. And the mic, as for anybody who knows microphones, probably recognizes that as a, um, a Neumann uh, TLM-103, which, again, is used to be Bill DeWeese's microphone of choice. So that's where that idea came from. Bought it used on, uh, uh, you yeah, know, one of those sites. But uh, yeah, so not a lot of changes over the years with with this room, but uh, uh, it's a great, you know, um, it's 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 not. I think one of the things that one of the reasons I designed it the way I did is there are very few distractions in this room. So when I sit down and I, I want to get into a story, into a read, um, the only thing I really see that's going on in the room is the screen and the script. Uh and of course, if there's conversation with the, you know, with the client, uh, that you know, usually those are just audio only. But um, but yeah, I tr I try to avoid distraction, and um, I think one of the things that I like about this is you know people talk about being retired. Um, I turned seventy six this year, and um, I 
I've never liked the idea of retirement. Uh, to me, that was giving up and, you know, throwing in your chips and okay, then you go off to, you know, to Neverland or whatever. But, right. um, um, but yeah, so I, I, I never really liked the idea of, of, uh, of that. So, um, but I spend probably uh, anywhere from zero to five or six hours in here. I average two or three hours a day and okay. make a good living at it. And, and so, and it allows my wife and I to do things that, uh, uh, that we'd like to do. I mean, we've, we've well, including we've, taking time off and going places. Exactly. To yes, exactly. So, uh, and that is your road. I know you put together a kit for recording on the road. If you get a gig that, can't wait for you to get back home to the studio. Did that work out for you? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> not not in the slightest. Yeah, I, I, I tried it a couple of times, but uh, the, the hotel experience with that kit uh, didn't work. And so well, compared to compared to the sound you get out of that room, I can't imagine it would. That was that was probably the biggest part of the problem, because a lot of the work I get is is repeat business from clients and everything has to sound like it sounded, you know, it, it right. can't change a lot. And, and so, yeah, it just, so, it, it wasn't practical. Before we bail here, tell me, tell me one of your most interesting, most enjoyable projects that you've done. <laughs> wow. There are a lot of them. I know um, it doesn't have to be the most, just one of them that, that comes to mind. There are a lot, of, a them. lot of fun. Uh, um, okay. So uh, probably the best story uh, that yeah. I can think of, uh, is, uh, this was, boy, this was early on. Uh, I, I, I had the room at the time. Uh, it was through, uh, voices.com, which really turned out to not be a big success for me, but, but a, um, a producer, a, uh, in New York, uh, reached out to me and, uh, he said, I've, I've created this video and it's a story of uh, a guy and his wife who's in his, he's in his fifties. I guess she was too. And, uh, uh, and they honeymooned in Hawaii and they took pictures, uh, had them developed and then put the developed pictures in this sort of military ammunition can thing and buried it in some rocks. And then they promised that they would go back to that someday visit it find it again and open it up and look at the pictures uh and so he said i'd i'd like you to try to i'd like you to be the that guy right and, and this 50 year old guy well i was older than that then but so unfortunately when i was hired i had a severe cold and i just felt awful that day just awful and and so I thought, oh well i'll just do it anyway you know i, I just got to do it just push through it so it was the only job I did that day. So I came down and I and I got the script and and I and I read it and and I thought, eh, who knows, right? And I sent it to him. Um, he loved it, and um, I use that same um, recording today as one of my demos. And you know, we talk about what Bill Dewey, what uh, Bill Deweese's demos got for me, but that sample has gotten me more business than any other sample or any other recording I've ever done. Can you match that sound with the cold? Well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so I'm trying to remember the script. Um, yeah, I have, to, I have to really drop my voice. Um, we were all young once. And, um. With too much time and no money. So I packed my bags and went searching for something we think we lost a long time ago. And that goes <laughs> on from there. I love it. I love it. Classic, classic Bob Darling. Okay. So to wrap this up, people who are listening to this. Now, the Crossroads Diner for me is that place where your spirit goes when it's time to evaluate what you're doing and the waitresses in that in that diner to me are faith and hope and grace and lucy and lucy is lucifer who's going to uh tempt your <laughs> tempt your ego and faith is right now looking helping you look forward in the present and uh hope is 
is is that vision of what you're looking for. But grace is self-forgiveness for the decisions you made that might not have worked out. So as you sit here talking to my audience and and who are at, probably at a crossroads like that, what's what kind of counsel? One of the things that you said that I really really loved is what are you good at? What do you love? Uh, have you got to? Can you summarize those thoughts for us? Well, I'd say the same thing I'd say to our daughters, and that is, um, yeah, find something that you love that resonates and then be fearless. Just go after it. And, yeah, you'll you'll take it on the chin multiple times, probably. Hopefully you'll have support. But even if you don't, stick with it. And uh, uh, if it's something you love, chances are I think it'll work out. So. You've been on this planet a while, a little while longer than me. And uh, that philosophy <laughs> seems to, you, you hadn't, it seems not to have killed you yet. So, not yet. Uh, <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> so, from Salt Lake City, uh, my buddy Bob Darling's counsel for uh, things to consider when you're in the Crossroads Diner. Hopefully, you'll come back with us next week and see who's with us and, and listen to what they have to say. And if you are at a crossroads right now, listen to Bob, listen to your heart, listen to your gut. And if you take a risk and it doesn't work out, change direction. For Bob Darling, I'm Steve McCurdy for the Crossroads Diner. We'll see you next week. Come on by and have a bite at the Crossroad Diner, the place your spirit goes when it might be time to change direction. If you know someone who might be at one of those crossroads, send them a link to one of the episodes that you like in the Crossroad Diner. It might be the very thing that they need. And we'll see you next time right here in the diner.